Hey, Wyoming, Silent Majority. Welcome back to Level Writing. I'm Nost Boss. And finally, we're at a new stage of writing, lore, and, well, generating, like, creating lore and delivering lore. This is probably going to be a quick one, but let's get started. So, with lore, uh, it depends on your story. Otherwise, I like to think of it as looking at both the structure of your. Something's in my mouth. Someone in my mouth. Um, the structure of your. What do you call it? Not story. Structure of your setting. Wait a second. Setting and setting, setting in the world. This is um, something you need to consider. So let's use um, uh, Marokana's godly. Revival. For an example. Whoa! That, I thought that was shift. I thought that was shift. Um, so we're using our story as an example. So one thing we're doing is we're, we need to develop the lore on the world. In reverse. So to develop it, we need to take normal lore that you would have gained throughout the... Uh, throughout your story and over it differently. So in our case, so for this one, I'm just going to lay out a baseline. For instance, it is freed and winds up in Luxum, Luxum Crest um, and flying and, and addresses the fact it is cursed by obsidian. Something he is all too familiar with. It's prisoner. Here we'd probably have some internal monologue about uh, maybe, maybe about maybe how, how only a hero could display spell the curse um like instead of actively pursuing something she's trying to gather information so so then instead of here she's like well i am not strong strong enough to fix this but i'll head on it elsewhere. Elsewhere we go. Go. And we can have an encounter. We can string this along a little bit, extrapolate it more. But then we get to another city, and there we can meet someone else who can... Give a little bit of lore on what's happening here in this town. Giving a little bit more lore here. On uh, maybe... Maybe garner what uh, what it's like living under the Overlord Obsidian. Now, another piece of lore I like doing... Especially when I'm involved. I like using... Um, 
um, a facsimile. So I really like trying to do. So this is coming from my D&D campaign. One thing I do, you know, like, uh, what what is it? Uh, my king, my king, and 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 his minions have seized the island of Horadai. It is written only Link can defeat Ganon. Or, or, um, or only, only this weapon can defeat the BBG. So, let me ask you this. Why is the party involved if on only the hero can slay the BBG with a magic sword? You might as well just put yourself in the story and make it a power fantasy, which is not good. What I propose instead, especially in D&D, if you have a party, if you have a party, make a single power or magic that anyone can use and learn learn in a series in a reasonable amount of time <coughs> Hi. if you have a party Make a single power or magic that anyone can use and learn in a reasonable amount of time. Access accessible. Mm -hmm. Thus, it doesn't become a prophecy. It becomes. It becomes. The. So, I'm going to give you my D&D story. I have a thing called Void. This induces reverse, reverse effects on things. Along with other side, side effects. This is the, this is the eating of it. We, I have a single, I have a... Um, handful of individuals in my story that have this new power called Day. Day is a neutralizing magic. It works on imagination. Imagination. And thus you can use it along with other things. The cool thing here is that that this can neutralize void. This neutralizes the void, it doesn't kill it, it makes the fights fair. Fights against the void now become even. Now, that can become a slog there's another type of magic I put in called chaos. Chaos magic is comprised of everything. And it, it takes 
three years of training to learn. Learn after having a spell of each element. And I'll put this like this. And I'll even bold it for you guys. S spells imbued with the power of chaos deal deal ten times the amount of of damage as normal and is always super effective and it's supposed to be imbued i know M embedded so now how you're saying this works with lore i don't like prophecies prophecies are a thing unless you flip it on its head i think i had a story somewhere i forget which one it was one of my stories had um what was it one of my four stories had um like a like there was like the hero of prophecy but we all know the main character is the first character i tend to introduce so you know this person's the hero whoever i've introduced first they're clearly the hero of the prophecy they're clearly the main character of the story i make it clear but then the people in other towns they believe something else and now there's another person they're claiming to be the hero of prophecy even though it's uh, like fake Kinda. Like I like flip flop like flipping the idea of the chosen one and all that. So what does it have to do with lore? Um Well I'm trickling in new stuff, so I have this character. Um so a character in my campaign has been lightly study studying studying the void for a year now and he he is led to believe that he can escape his void. Now, here's the crux of this. He's been in the void for, he's been studying it for a year. He took notes, notes on his encounters and and what can happen. But these are the these these come from an area where the void is at its weakest. Later, we can drop the bigger effects of the void. And it's all about like timing and getting it down and lore. If I can even stroke uh, a small bit, lore can come from anywhere. The town you're in, books you're reading, 
um, you're setting a concept, all these stuff, you need to give the thing a name and you need to give it something else. And what I find interesting about lore, or at least lore dumping, it's like, it's like little tidbits about the world. Uh, what was that skit from, um, what's his name? Offbeat Outlaw. Like, he says, uh, what is it? Um, the the entire um what do you call it oh, what's it called the entire uh their border crossing is a trying to go to the water god if you fire a question it's like question like how big is it? And you start saying, uh, the shrine is a safe passage for realms in trade. This is kind of, um, I think it's like, you know, we don't ask for lore on that. We ask for lore on other things. There is ways to deliver lore and there's ways to uh use uh like lore to your advantage lore here in this sense is well if the empire border crossing is a um is a uh is a shrine to the water god then if someone says well how big is it and you're starting to spew off um, like lore or even like contents of books. You start to give in exposition and or, or, and or lore on things. So if I can go into my story one more time, there were four legendary heroes. Said to have defeated Tiamat. However, one uh one cat um sorry, one of the party members mem members um it's a uh, meeting with it with um it's a meeting with it's something from 500 years ago from that time period we start to form connections This starts to form a connection. You start to piece together puzzle pieces. It becomes a puzzle. Something that not everyone does even worry is like solve puzzles. Solve it and solve them on their own. And if you need it, um, like that's right, it becomes a puzzle. So you're like, well, I have this piece, this piece can go here, this piece can go here, and then starts clicking. So it's like, oh, hey, it's this guy. It's person X. Uh, they do this. Um, it helps if you're in character and you're doing it. this becomes like a like layers
we start diving into wait where how did i put this here and then i'll put i'll put this here so that's that i feel pretty good about that Um, now I'm not so sure what's left in terms of writing lore or generating lore, but that becomes on you. Pretty soon we're going to be tackling this kind of stuff when we get to uh, story writing. So we're going to get to that uh, next time. Till then. Okay. Ciao.